Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Shada Soleimani. I am a fellow this semester at the Brown Arts Initiative. Um, I'm also a professor at Brandeis University in studio arts and an artist. And in all of the spare time that I have, I am a federally licensed wildlife rehabilitator. So I'm just going to kind of give you a little background before I get started. Um, as an artist, my work and my research has traditionally focused a lot on human rights violations in the OPEC country regions or in the greater Swana region, so Southwest Africa and the Middle East. Um, my parents are both political refugees from Iran and escaped in like the mid 80s at different times and came here. So I grew up with a lot of stories about their history escaping Iran and coming here. And you know, consequently, I was really interested in human rights violations because of what happened to them. And another kind of note, my mom, who used to be a nurse when she was in Iran, um, when she moved to the States and immigrated here, was not able to practice nursing. So she started doing wildlife rehabilitation. And so I grew up in a home with lots of weird, like kind of strange baby animals running around, um, watching my mom trying to like mend, you know, roadkill. Some of it would make it, some of it wouldn't. And so that's always been something that's kind of been in the back of my practice. Caretaking has been really important, but I've never really brought it in until lately. So I'm going to just kind of start with, and I've never given this presentation before, so this will be interesting. Um, it's a little nonlinear, but I'm going to kind of start with a little bit of my research um, with the oil industry and thinking a lot about extractive economies and how those extractive economies have consequently created environmental disasters. And then I'm going to get into how you know, for a long time, I kind of tried to separate my rehab work and separate my like conservation work and my art practices, like for my own sanity. And a lot lately has kind of started bleeding in. So I'll talk about that too. So in 2013, I started grad school and I was thinking a lot about like the greater Middle East and thinking about how people in the West kind of view the Middle East. And you know, you think of like Persian rugs, the movie Aladdin, which is very Orientalist, and oil. And I started thinking a lot about how, you know, when I would tell someone that I'm Iranian, one of the first questions that I'd get asked about is, you know, oh, do your parents have oil money, or do you come from an oil background, or do you know anything about like nuclear, the nuclear enrichment program? All of the answers obviously were no. <laughs> but I started thinking a lot about portraiture especially in photography, a genre that's dominated by a male-centric lens, or what I call a lens dick that penetrates the world non-consensually, I thought about a practice of creating a consensual image. And what does it mean to create a portrait without showing a body? And so I started thinking about gross domestic product reports. And if you look at the GDP of Iran, 98% of that GDP is dominated by the oil industry. The other 2% is agricultural, pomegranates, pistachios, and saffron. And so I thought about making a portrait of Iran and you know, what it would mean to make that portrait or what it would look like. So this was kind of my first take. And this is the first take where I started learning, you know, doing a lot of research and learning, oh, well, that 98% of that oil economy is really trashing the other 2% of what's happening. You know, the agricultural sector, albeit totally like messed up in its own ways, was not flourishing because of all of the land that was being used for oil, but also all of the pollution that was coming out of all of these oil wells, facilities, and refining plants. So I made this image, and I was like, OK, it's a little too pretty. Like, if I really want to talk, and I'm really interested in seduction, but if I really want to like talk about these issues, I don't want to make an image that's too easy. So I started thinking a little bit more about seduction, you know, a way that you can take a topic that's difficult, because if you're watching the news, you're going to see something that, you know, is bad happening, let's say, in Afghanistan, when everyone was escaping and trying to get out, it was really hard for people to watch those images. They're like, oh, it's too sad. I want to keep a quote unquote positive bubble, which I find interesting. Um, but to be said, I think it's really interesting to try to pull people into these issues by using seduction. So I think a lot about Trojan horses and how I think about advertising images to try to pull in audiences or viewers to contend with difficult topics. And as a lot of these works, I started thinking about these environmental kind of like issues that were happening in these specific areas. So this is another one that's my second take of GDP Iran. Again, wrestling is the national sport, thinking a lot about like sports economies, extractive economies being paralleled, um, saffron, the petroleum as well. 
This is another GDP of Iran, so the dates, again, boxing being another national sport, the date palms kind of being this like other image of Orientalist Middle East. I'm just gonna kind of zoom through a lot of these images. Um, and then again, Afghanistan, the opium poppies, thinking a lot about those exports, Afghanistan not being a place that is known for petroleum exports, and kind of how those two images are kind of conflated with one another, soccer being a national sport. And then also thinking a lot about our oceans. And I know that sounds really cheesy, but doing all of this research with offshore wells, thinking about the petroleum that's leaching into the wild, into the lake waters, and thinking about my work as a conservationist um, in Rhode Island, and how every so often we actually will get oil spill victims here. So thinking about the consequences of even here, somewhere that's not in the Middle East where we're not seeing a lot of oil, these things still happen. So they're happening close to home, and it's you know, really become part of my practice to start bringing that in. So in my series, Crudes, I was thinking a lot about crude oil petroleum products, um, thinking about how crude oils and petroleum are like in everything that we own, and we might not even know it, like that 70s polyester shirt that you might have that has like some cool prints on it. It's made out of plastic. It's made out of crude oil. And so thinking about the implications of what all of these products have and how they kind of fit into our lives. So basketballs made out of crude oil. And I'm thinking about specific crude oil blends. So here I'm looking at Basra Light. It comes out of Iraq. Um, light crude oils are used for specific, you know, types of blends. Heavies are used for other, like, types of products. They're sweets, they're sours, and condensates. So all of these terms refer to the viability of that blend to be able to be manufactured or turned into something else. So Basra Light is used for basketballs, um, it's used for petroleum jelly, and it's used for butyl rubber gloves. So I started thinking about creating still lives of these crude oil blends, what these, you know, what a portrait of this blend would look like. In the background, you have a aerial map of the field and the refinery where that blend is produced. And then this is in Louisiana where Bayou Choctaw Sweet and Bayou Choctaw Sour are produced. So you can kind of see the swamps are like, I mean, it's a bayou, so they are swampy, but it's overly flooded. There's a lot of trees that are just like dying because of the petroleum and the oil that's leaching into the soil and into the waters. So this is Bayou Choctaw Sweet. Also thinking about Louisiana's you know, sacred prized crawfish, and those are actually, if you're starting to look at the numbers, are really, really starting to get polluted and they're not able to process or farm them the same way that they were. Um, thinking also about like sports here, wiffle balls are made out of Bayou Choctaw sweet and sour condensate blends. And also the picnic kind of blanket that you're seeing in the at, like back is made out of plastic and those are made out of like Bayou Choctaws and Texas blends. This is West Texas Sour. West Texas Sour is um, used a lot in the football helmets, which is really funny. I was like doing so much research and looking at like, okay, what happens to all this crude oil? Some of it goes into chewing gum, like you'll see in the next image. A lot of them are used for sports, household cleaning products. And so in Iran Heavy, I'm looking at, you know, this oceanic city that has this refinery in it. All of the fishing industry, all of the fish are starting to, you know, get contaminated, many of which are dying. They cannot be sold anymore for food, and so they're kind of being culled at this point. Um, the actual blend of Iran Heavy, it's kind of like a double entendre, but it's used for weights. So you could put them into lifting weights and barbells and bubble gum. So after doing crudes, you know, and this is the last one, Alaska North Slope. So you're thinking about like oceanic areas in Alaska. This is really starting to affect the mussels, the oysters, a lot of the like bivalves in the area. Um, this huge Alaskan pipeline that's like running across the whole state from shore to shore is really, really creating a lot of tree loss, leaching into the soils. So and a lot of sulfur as well is coming out of those zones. So I was thinking a lot about these portraits and what it means for us to contend with these, you know, daily products that we use so often and how can I kind of make portraits of them. So 
that was kind of like the beginning of me looking at these types of, you know, environmental disasters from afar. I didn't go to visit any of those locations. And that was always interesting for me, like doing the research, talking to like naturalists that are on the ground there, talking to oil workers, you know, getting testimonials and getting them to send me images. But I never got to actually go visit any of these sites. So this past summer, um, delayed because of COVID, but I was able to go visit two different places who asked me to respond to environmental disasters that had happened there. The first being Ilva in Italy. So the Ilva plant is a steel manufacturing plant in the city of Toronto in Italy. Um, they have been manufacturing you know, steel, cold pressed, hot pressed steel for the past 40, 50 years, but in that time, people have been seeing a lot of pollution and a lot of these kind of irons and oxides leaching not only into the soil, into the water, but into people's lungs. So the amount of cancer you know, cases have gone up exponentially. On a windy day, they won't let kids uh, go to school because they're worried about you know, the oxides in the air getting into, like the dust actually getting into people's lungs. So I got to visit this past summer and got to kind of like do some research on the ground. Learned a lot about the exports and the things that the city's famous for. Mussels being one of those kind of products that they're like, oh, we're on the ocean, we have the best mussels. Well, last year's report um, on their mussels showed that about 80% of them had some sort of pollutant you know, in, in them and were not able to be sold at market. Um, another fun fact is that Italy has a lot of olive trees that are dying in that region, um, some of which because of that industry, to the point of which they started importing olive oil from Greece. It's like they're like dirty secret. No one wants to know that Italians are importing olive oil. So I started thinking about all of these GDPs, you know, all of these agricultural exports and how they are being affected by the industry in Toronto. So this is kind of a still life of Ilva. It's called pillars of industry. So I'm thinking about the steel tools, you know, being these pillars that uphold these, you know, values, the factory stack also being these pillars that uphold this industry. Um, the second trip I went on to was to Iceland. Um, I think I have a second, actually, that's a second Italy image, so it's a little out of order. So this is the mussels. These are the columns, thinking a lot about pillars again at ancient Roman sites um, and the fishing nets. And then in the background, so each image has a background source image. These are the source images that I took myself while I was in Toronto. So the last image with the factory stacks, those are source images that I took on my trip there instead of having them sourced from you know, other researchers or people on the ground. And this image in the background is of all of the streets co covered in the red ferrous iron dust. So if you're like driving around the streets, it's like the whole, it feels like you're kind of like in a sandstorm, but of iron dust, which is a little freaky. And people are living there, but so are animals and they're you know, really hurting because of it. So the last image that I missed, which is this one, should be next. Um, the second project I was asked to do was to go to Italy or to Iceland. So after Italy, I traveled to Iceland, and they had asked me because of my work with the oil industry. There was a perspective of uh, drilling in the north and thinking about what would it mean to start oceanic drilling in Iceland. And a lot of people were really concerned. The government was even concerned to the point where they started asking artists to come in and do some research and pose alternatives. So I was interested in the oil, but I was a little bit more interested in you know, how the agricultural industry and the geothermal water industry was really destroying native breeding grounds for birds, um, wetlands especially. So a lot of their agricultural crops are wheat. They're growing you know, wheat to feed their lambs, their cows, and they're also cod fishing. And so something we like hear about like Icelandic cod or Norwegian cod, almost all of these are farmed. They are farmed in the ocean in open water pens, but they're injected with antibiotics because when you're in a pen with you know, hundreds of thousands of fish, you're so packed closely together that these infections are transmitting between fish and another fish and mutating. And so you know, these are these industries that are prized in this region, but are also really destructive to the oceanic like, environment around them. So I was looking, these are source images from my trip. 
Um, but the main reason that I was really interested in Iceland was because of the Karanjukur plant. So the geothermal plant um, and dam was built on the site of native breeding grounds of pink-footed geese and reindeer. And this, you know, whole entire 730 meter wide dam just flooded all of these ecosystems and all of these wetlands where these animals would come. They'd migrate and they'd nest. And so I was interested in what became of that project. It was put into effort. You know, the dam is now fully functioning and Iceland prides itself on their geothermal energy and their geothermal water. It's the fifth largest dam in all of Europe. And that's the site of the dam now. So that's what it looks like. Um, when we went and visited, there was a sandstorm that was happening in the dam because of all of the, you know, wetlands that were leached. There's all of these like stones, gravel, mud, and it's just this awful, awful environment that should not exist there. So all of these geese that are migrating stop at where they used to stop or have stopped for hundreds of years at this point, and now they don't find wetlands and they don't find breeding grounds. They find a dam and they find sandstorms. So I was interested in creating still lives from my research images and my trip there that kind of talk about all of these industries. So again, thinking about gross domestic product reports, I'm thinking about aluminum being an export from Iceland, the cod being an export, cod liver oil pills even, um, and thinking also about the water and this kind of idea of Icelandic glacial water. So they have these water bottles that are shaped like glaciers that are kind of speaking about like Icelandic pureness and their waterfalls and their glaciers being so pure, but melting and you know turning into these dams. So that was my second project. And I started thinking a lot, like I said in the beginning, um, about blurring these boundaries. I am a wildlife rehabilitator, um, and I do happen to make work. And so I was like artwork, and I was thinking about what it meant for these two things to kind of collide. So it's been kind of a long time coming, but I've tried to keep it separate. I've had a lot of people ask me, oh, like, when is your rehab work going to start coming into your artwork? And I was really resistant because I think there is this tendency, especially in the art world, to try to pin somebody for doing some type of work or to exotify someone to make them into a character, character or even a caricature of something that they might not fully be. But I started out slow. So I'm going to show you a few photos of some of my patients. So at Congress of the Birds, um, which is my wildlife clinic, um, I'm closely affiliated with the Wildlife Clinic of Rhode Island, so they trained me, and I've just kind of gone on my own and to do all of the wild birds on my own, really, in my house. Um, I get calls from all over the state. My number is listed publicly. I've gotten, like, three phone calls while I was, like, in the Q&A earlier, so people are bringing animals to my door nonstop, especially in the summer, which is right now. So this is a little wood duck that came by, or came through last year. Obviously, my goal as a rehabilitator is always to rehabilitate and release. Animals should not, wild animals should not be kept in captivity, and that's something that I really try to talk about when I've been making work um, with wildlife lately. People will see, you know, a baby animal or a baby squirrel and think like, oh, it's so cute, it's so tame, I'll keep it as a pet, I'll feed it, I'll keep it in my pocket, it could come to work with me, I'm gonna name it. And these are all the things that we don't wanna see. People project these kind of ideas onto these animals and try to domesticate them, and they're not meant to be with us or domesticated. Um, so again, the main goal of rehabilitation is to rehab and release. Sometimes because of what happens to animals, mostly because of human-caused you know, issues, window strikes primarily, it's a big one that we deal with. I also have to humanely euthanize a lot of animals that come into my clinic. So it's not easy or fun work but it's a form of caretaking that I started likening to governance. And I'm thinking about, you know, in my previous work, how governments fail to provide for their peoples. Well, how am I, you know, able to provide for these animals that are coming into my care? And how can I be a good caretaker or a sovereign, you know, state? Who knows? Um, this is a barred owl that was hit by a car while it was hunting. So I always tell people, do not throw fruit out of your windows while you're driving because it attracts rodents to the side of the street. These guys are, you know, nocturnal for the most part and will come out when they see like a rodent going for easy pickings. If you think about it, a road is a pretty like kind of blank terrain. So if you throw a fruit into the street or like an apple core, the mouse is gonna come see it. It's gonna be easy for the owl to see the mouse because there's nothing else around. It will swoop in and then your car will hit it before you know. 
So this guy was with me for over a month. Um, fortunately, did not shatter either of his eyes, um, but we were able to release him about a month after into the area he was found. This is a baby barred owl. Um, so we also, you know, do baby raptors as well. We try to renest them as often as possible. Sometimes we get a lot of homeowners that do not want animals renested on their property. So this was a tree company that had cut down a tree that these barred owl parents were nesting in. They fell out of the nest and the tree owners, or the house owners where the tree existed, did not want them to be renested on a different tree because they complained about the noise that the owls were making at night. So I always try to encourage people to live with wildlife, not against it. Um, another tree company story. So I also tell people, you know, in the springtime is not the time to be cutting down your trees. Please do all of your work for landscaping in the fall. It's really important to think about, you know, the springtime is when animals are starting to build nests. They might have already built a nest and you might not know about it, like these downy woodpeckers. So these downy woodpeckers' um, nest was cut out of a tree. Again, the owners of the property did not want the birds re-nested anywhere nearby because they were afraid that they would peck on their metal roof um, and they did not want them to ruin the house, which is not what woodpeckers do. Don't get me started. So this is when they arrived. They were about two days old. There were a few eggs that had not even yet hatched. Um, again, I want to also put out there that the myth of the smell thing is real. Birds cannot smell you. The only birds that really will be able to smell you for the most part, a few can, but vultures have really big nasal cavities. They are meant to smell carrion. But these little tiny woodpeckers, if I touched them and if the mom was to come see them, you know, she would not know that I had touched her babies because of a smell. So the first thing I also tell people, like when you find a baby bird, if it's fallen out of a nest, if it's not injured, see if you could put it back into the nest. Again, always call a wildlife rehabilitator to get advice or figure out how to do this, but Birds can't smell, so don't freak out. So this is about after five days, six days with me, they started opening their eyes. You see that they're starting to kind of grow their pin feathers that are covered in these kind of black sheaths. Um, when I first got them here, I did not know what type of woodpecker they were because they look like just strange little blobs of meat with no eyes. <laughs> um, so I was, you know, curious. I was like, all right, I know these are woodpeckers, A, because of the cavity dwelling they have, B, because of their beak structure, but I have no idea besides that. So by the time that they got to this age, I was like, okay, these are downy woodpeckers, which are the smallest species of woodpecker in North America. And this is right before release. So, you know, these are like the good kind of stories. We got, you know, a lot of these per year, but it's good to remember that these happen because we see a lot of death in rehab as well. Um, so about a month in, they were outside in an aviary. They were naturally foraging for berries, for worms, and we soft released them into our backyard. So they all were able to fly away successfully with no deaths. I didn't hatch the eggs, but don't suggest trying that. All right, so ethics. Um, so I just showed you a lot of really cute animals before that. I talked about environmental disaster, and I've kind of talked a little bit about how those things are starting to come into my work. I think the first thing for me when I started realizing that I did want to bring the animals into my work was that I wanted to shoot on their terms. I am, you know, and when it comes to using animals in my work, I'm a rehabber first and an artist second. When it's coming to an animal that's used that's not alive, like the fish in Iran Heavy, I don't feel, you know, as bad. But <laughs> I think when it comes to using an animal that's sentient and, like, able to understand, I don't want to scare them. So my first rule is that I do not use flash in my photography. Um, naturally lit. You could use a bright light, but birds' eyes actually see light very differently than people's. So these lights that are around us right now, we don't think they're flickering, but if a bird was in here, it would actually like notice that the lights are flickering. So I'm really conscious about, you know, if I'm photographing them, what's the light situation like? And if I can't get a good light situation, then I do not take the image. I also think about, you know, I do not photograph animals if they're injured. <laughs> I think like being an injured animal is probably really difficult enough. Having to interact with humans and having them touch you, it's not a fun experience. So I don't want to think about exploiting them in that way. 
Um, so I photograph, you know, animals. I don't want to say on their own terms because I probably wouldn't really want to be in the photo in the first place, but I try to make it as like not stressful as possible. So no bright lights, not much handling, um, and very limited interaction. So I probably will try to get the shot in less than one or two minutes to make sure that the animal's not in that space for a long time. I also don't take these images in my studio. Um, I build the environments around them. So a lot of the images that you're seeing before this, um, I'm thinking a lot about building, building and fabricating these tableaus in my studio settings. I'm lighting them with strobes. I'm shooting them like, you know, it really long kind of periods of time, two, three hours until I get the shot that I get. I try to make sure that the shot is like exactly how I want it before I bring an animal in. And so I'm building these, you know, in my wildlife clinic or in my kitchen or in my dining room, which are not typical spaces that I work in, but those are the spaces that the animals might come through or I might be triaging animals in. So for the New York Times, um, so these past two images, the New York Times asked me about um, having fun during COVID. This was this past year in 2021. And I thought it was a kind of irresponsible question because if you really think about it, COVID's not fun. And to think about having fun and talking about having fun at a time of such like immense loss is like such a privilege. And so I started thinking a lot about what did bring me, you know, some sort of like compassion or like, you know, a little bit of compassion fatigue or like a little bit of like joy during the pandemic was animal rehab work. And so I started kind of focusing on that. So in coping mechanisms, this is a series of images, I'm focusing on how wildlife rehab and conservation was kind of a coping mechanism for me to get through the pandemic. So these images um, focus on some of the patients that were in my care during the time. Um, and then this one's kind of like a tools of the trade image. So in the bottom, you have Air Jordan's box that was uh, delivered with this blue jay that was dead on arrival. Um, we also have this house finch that had conjunctivitis. Please clean your bird feeders. And thinking about all of the other things like stress decks, which is like Gatorade for birds when they're dehydrated. We use um, antibiotics, you know, pain relief, like Medicam. So all of these kind of, you know, medicines kind of coming into how I take care of the birds. Um, also have some pretty funny stories for rehab. So this past year, I also had swans in my bathtub until our, we have a wildlife clinic in our basement, but at the time the clinic was not finished. So we were housing swans in our bathtub and we were not able to bathe in our bathtub during that time. So, you know, thinking a lot about how these animals kind of exist around us and we have to navigate around them. Um, we also work with a lot of domestics, not by choice, but because a lot of people in the general public don't know the difference between domestic and wild animals. So people will find a lot of animals um, and bring them to us thinking, this one was brought to me as a wild hawk, which it obviously is not. This is a broiler chicken. So this chicken <laughs> fell off of the back of a truck en route to the slaughterhouse, which is really unfortunate. Um, these chickens are genetically bred for meat, so oftentimes they cannot support themselves on their limbs. They're far too heavy. And so she was not able to lift her body. Um, a few hours after coming into care, she succumbed to death. This is actually a photo of her dead, which she would not be able to tell. But I also want to talk about these stories and how, you know, we are thinking a lot about animals being these expendable kind of things and like making them work for us, which I don't fully agree with. These are my own chickens that came to me through wildlife rehab, one as a quote unquote pigeon and the other as a hawk. Um, the top chicken was found in Roger Williams Park. Um, she was dumped. She was completely paralyzed, so she had two splay legs um, and couldn't walk. So we did some physical therapy. She was in a hammock for a month, and after about three months of PT, was able to start walking. So these images, like really for the New York Times, for me were introducing my rehab work, bringing them into the style of how I photograph, but trying to talk about you know other ways of coping. And wildlife rehab is really a coping mechanism for me. These are my two of my quails. Also, quails that people thought were wild. Bob whites are not wild in the state of Rhode Island, really. <laughs> and these are Caternix quails. 
then I'm just going to end with my last image. This is a kind of short presentation. But um, I recently have started doing a lot of work with my parents' story and my parents' history. So because of their time as political refugees, I grew up with a lot of stories about them. You know, in Iran, my mother was in solitary confinement for over a year um, in the city of Khoi. Um, and talks a lot about her experience there. And she was also the one that taught me how to rehabilitate wildlife. So in my newest series, Ghost Strider, I'm really starting to finally bring in the wildlife rehab into my work in a way that I haven't before. And so ethics, again, really important here. This is the Eastern Bluebird that I rehabilitated. She was a window strike. Um, and so, fun fact, since we are talking about wildlife, um, if a bird hits your window, if you, th you have to think about it like if you're um, driving a car and you get in a car crash, your airbags might go off if you have a you know, hard enough impact. Well, birds have air sacs under their skin. So if they have impact, there's these like, you know, sacs under their skin that will inflate. They look like they're kind of wearing like a life jacket. And so sometimes those air sacs will deflate on their own, but if they're inflated for too long, they could actually push a lot of organs out of the way. They could even push a leg like, you know, to kind of splay out to the side. And so this bird came to me from a high impact window strike and had inflated air sacs. And after some medication and a little bit of time, they weren't deflating. So I had to manually deflate them, which means poking a hole and you know, getting the air out, making sure that she was on a course of antibiotics. And after about, I think it was about three weeks, she was ready to be released. And that was concurrent with the time that my mom was visiting. And so she is the one who taught me how to rehabilitate birds. And I thought it was really important for us to release this bird together. But I also wanted to start talking about her story and her time in solitary confinement. So the image that's actually cut into strips is an image of the prison in which she was kept at, um, Hoi. And when she was in prison, she wrote a poem about being a caged and trapped bird. And it was really important for me to kind of like pair that, you know, poem and think about that idea of her being this caged and trapped bird with the release, you know, of this bird. So we took this photograph the day that the bird was released, and about two hours later, we released the bird back to where it was found. So that's where I'm going to end the presentation. Um, but there is a show up at Providence College Galleries right now called Ghost Rider that has this image and a few other images of my parents and their story. So if you're in the area, um, go check it out. And then if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right, I feel like we're all good. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, you're fine. Please. Thank you so much for this presentation. <laughs> Thank you for your question. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the um, oil image that was based out of the Texas oil fields and the, I want to say, grilled cheese sandwich stack. It's a petroleum grilled cheese sandwich, but yes. Good reference, you got it. Um, so I'm thinking a lot, so the Permian Basin is where all of the oil in Texas, um, West Texas Sour, West Texas Sweet, um, all of those blends kind of come from. Um, they actually haven't been drilling in the Permian Basin as much in the past three, four years, and so they've been trying to like rebrand the Permian Basin as the new breadbasket of Texas. And so I'm thinking about, you know, all of these industries where they have been drilling and what it means for that soil that is now growing wheat. You know, it's all Monsanto. It's all like, you know, super like overly GMO and thinking about, you know, what it means for those two things to coexist. So yeah, that's the kind of wheat reference, but the petroleum also comes from a West Texas sour blend. So yeah, wheat petroleum sandwich, extra white bread. Uh, thank you. That was so incredibly uh, rich, and, and your work is so powerful and, and so coherent in in, um, uh, in your in your way of thinking through things. And 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 um, 
this is more a, a, a comment than a question, but I'd love uh, to invite you to respond to it. I guess I was thinking about what connected the uh, beginning to the end, and I was um, the, so the GDP stuff to the sort of uh, wildlife rehabilitation stuff. And I was thinking for me that really makes sense very deeply through a kind of eco-feminist critique of GDP itself as being you know, that standard by which uh, the world could only and has only been been led into um, uh, you know very destructive um, uh, kinds of actions. GDP GDP being um, uh, an emphasis on profit beyond what is produced for subsistence, right? Absolutely. So GDP does has no pays no attention to what is uh, produced simply to be um, used or consumed within mm. a household within. Uh, uh, within a culture. And uh, it does seem that care of the kind that you're doing uh, is precisely that other kind of work which GDP has never paid any attention to. And so there's a critique of the very sort of um, capitalist economy of GDP through the sort of giving of one's time to this kind of work for which there is no profit, which does not enter into any logbooks anywhere, and which in the end is sort of um, whose best form is in its own disappearance, sort of, it's this invisible work, traditionally women's work, and yes. that again makes the sort of link with your mother at the end so very powerful. So anything you want to say? No, thanks so much. It's like, I think about all of those things all the time, and it's really rare that I like find someone that actually picks up on all of those threads, so thank you. <laughs> um, I think a lot, so when you're talking about like GDP, like not being for the family and not being at home, I think the one case that I always think about is um, during the Iraqi invasion, um, the United States started planting cash crops of corn in Iraq, and that became one of the main GDPs. Um, the Iraqis weren't using the corn. They weren't eating the corn. It was being re-exported. It was being grown there because we didn't want to use our crops and being re-exported to the United States um, so we can make Kellogg cereal, corn flakes. And so I started thinking a lot about, yeah, how GDP is not for the people. It's a profit-driven economy. It's not a system of care. It's a system of like consumption. And you know, it's really overwhelming all of these spaces in which these things are being grown or farmed. I mean, if we're also thinking about farming, we're thinking about farming practices that are not sustainable. The soils don't have like vetch crops growing between each year. You know, if you're thinking about fishing, those like, there's so many wild fish that get into these like antibiotic, you know, fish crates and they start commingling and there's no native populations of cod left, for example. So all of those things definitely come in. Um, and I think about them a lot. Uh, I think one thing I didn't mention is that I see a lot of animal cruelty cases and cases where animals, you know, come in because humans have done something without thinking. Farming, especially even on the ground, netting, birds tangled in netting, but definitely systems of care that have traditionally been women's work as well, nurturing and caretaking and noticing these kind of things that are lost in the overwhelming economy. So yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. I, my, my question was similar to what you just said, I think. Um, just when you, when you think about the wildlife rehabilitation, right? So many creatures that don't make it. Yes. And then the ones that do, and that feeling of when they go back wild, there's nothing like that, right? <laughs> but really then the real work, right, is all the care in between all of that. And so when you talk about um, that there's a therapy there that... So I'm interested in the, in what conservation is for all of us, right? Meaning even how you would define it. And then in maybe in your case, there's there's that process piece, that caring piece. So I don't know if you can just talk about, you know, what, where, how do you define or is your work with wildlife a conservation act? Or how, how do you talk about that, even if it's just to yourself? Because we yeah. all know not everyone wants to hear about our, our own definitions. Totally, <laughs> totally. I mean, for me, like... I think I always joke about it with like my friends in the art world or my friends in academia, you know, being in academia and being in the art world, both are like really awful places sometimes. And so I think about, you know, the wildlife rehab as a therapy, but that's not just what it is. It is conservation, right? Because if you think about, it's kind of an honor to work with these animals. Like these are creatures that people until COVID apparently didn't notice were living in their backyards. 
and they aren't thinking about the impacts that they're having when they're not cleaning their bird feeders, for example, on a very micro level, or they're not thinking about the impacts that they're having um, when they put up their blueberry netting, or you know, so many things, when they're spraying their lawns with pesticides. We, I see so many cases of mutation from, in, from chicks that have been hatched from eggs that have been around too many pesticides in crops. And so for me, it's like if I can, conservation for me means bringing awareness to the general public when I interact with them. I think, you know, unfortunately a lot of that is through social media now. And so if you could like just give people sound bites that are like, because everyone has a short attention span, give someone a sound bite about like what to do to try to like, you know, interact with their environment near them in like a way that's a little bit more, you know, thoughtful. <laughs> that is what it kind of means to me. I mean. On the personal basis, it's for me, it's like the feeling of knowing that, you know, one, one bird might not make a difference, but if I am committed to doing this for the rest of my life, which I am, that maybe all the times that I release a bird, maybe it'll make an impact, and that's the least that I feel like I could do. Yeah, this is like a very, like, not traditional presentation for me, because I've never talked about this before. So. <laughs> It's usually about like my work and human rights abuses and yeah, thanks for being my test audience. Um, I have one other question kind of building on what you've just said. I was really interested in the fact that you're like the ethics of photographing these birds and that your studio practice is now kind of wherever those birds are and wherever they're most comfortable. Um, and I'm curious for you as an artist, how you've noticed your practice and the way that you approach making has changed now that like your um, rehabilitation and your art making and your living spaces totally. are all together. Totally. <laughs> It's an interesting one because, um, you know, for the while that my wildlife clinic in my basement wasn't finished, all those living spaces were colliding. And so my triage room was my dining room. And so if we got like a patient in, we'd be eating dinner next to it. I'd be like, shh, we can't talk. We're going to stress out, you know, the whatever patient that's in the room. And so that's always been a consideration for me, like personally in my life. In my work, it's been different. So like I've always thought about obviously human rights violations, the male-dominated lens that penetrates the world, and like photography being a non-consensual medium that literally like takes someone and subjugates them to you know, being identified or stereotyped by the, the people that are looking at the images, and like thinking also a lot about um, Alan Sekula's like readings on how we look at an image and like decide who that person is based off of how we are societally conditioned, thinking a lot about like racial profiling, stereotyping. And so I never thought about applying that to animals. You know, I've always was like, oh yeah, like it's just an animal. Like, I mean, I didn't think that in my own work, but like if I saw like an image of, you know, like a chickadee, I would just be like, oh, it's just a chickadee. And then I started, like, I think really through rehab, realizing that people project on animals like all the time and how some of these so many of these projections are misguided or so many of them are so naive and hopeful about like how this person that found this robin is a spirit communicator with robins apparently and knows that the robin you know needs help because she was meant to find it like so all of these you know kind of things um or you know people not liking blue jays because they're aggressive and like all of those kind of ideas that we attach to animals, like the peace hawk and the war dove and all these symbols, to me, started becoming really apparent because they're not consensual. Like, the, we're identifying or stereotyping those animals based off of, like, how we view them or how we see them, the same way that we do with people, right? And so is there a possibility of, if I'm showing these animals or I'm using them in my work, is there a possibility of those types of labels and symbols also being broken down as well? And how can I do that? I don't think it's actually like fully possible, but I try. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. And if you ever find a wild bird, call Rhode Island Wildlife Rehab or find my number online. It's listed publicly. <laughs>